So once again, hello everybody, it's Monday, it's the Deer Park, it's the Buddha Center. Uh, let's get started like we normally do, you've all done this before. So let's just do a short period of bell meditation, followed by the three recitations, and then on with the talk for today. So I'll give you a moment, get into a nice meditation posture, and we'll begin at the sound of the bell. I go for refuge to the Buddha, the teacher. I go for refuge to the Dhamma, the teaching. I go for refuge to the Sangha, the taught. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dhamma. I take refuge in the Sangha. I have taken refuge in the Buddha. I have taken refuge in the Dhamma. I have taken refuge in the Sangha. Three pure precepts. Cease to do harm. Do only good. Do good for others. Bodhisattva vow. However innumerable all beings are, I vow to lead them all. However inexhaustible my delusions are, I vow to extinguish them all. However immeasurable the Dharma teachings are, I vow to master them all. However endless the Buddha's way is, I vow to follow it completely. Swaha. Welcome back again, everybody. So, on Friday, we talked about the individuality paradox, and it was based on wanting to be an individual. The idea that in the West, and especially it seems like in America, we, we get hit with this very early on, that, that we are the center of the universe, that everything we do should be for ourselves. So, part of that paradox is you want to be yourself but you also want to be part of a group, and we're going to talk about being part of a group today. I'm going to spin around here to see where the... Uh, oh, good, it's at the right spot. All right, so the Buddha awakened to the reality that unnatural craving and desire 
are what's at the core of our feelings of unsatisfactoriness and discontent and anguish, of course, suffering, uh, that, that is experienced by all human beings. And that was true then in the Buddhist time, and it is certainly true now. We only have to look around, right, to see that. And in Western culture, there is an aspect of societal interaction that is one of the major causal factors for those feelings of unsatisfactoriness, discontent. Human beings crave association based on a group or an interest or a worldview, and, and there's some other reasons too, and I'm sure you can think of some of them. Current and possible interactions and interconnections often get decided based on those associations. So this usually will result in avoiding those people that are not in whatever chosen group, right? Whatever chosen association of person. Engaging in interactions and interconnections only with those people that hold similar views can, and really often does, result in the arising of violence, hatred, envy, and mistrust. And I said, and often does, because even if we don't, um, we don't realize it ourselves, we may hold some of those views within us that we don't let loose and let other people even see, but they're thoughts that we hold. Now, it is natural for human beings to want to join a group. It's very natural. However, that choice should not be the determining factor in how a person connects and responds to individuals that hold differing worldviews. Basically, just because you hold a worldview doesn't mean you have to treat every, every other person that doesn't hold that worldview as something lesser. Like I said, though, people crave being an individual. Uh, like we talked about last uh, week on Friday, that whole unique expression of the universe idea. Most also, though, a crave, crave being associated with others. So being an individual within a group of like-minded or sometimes physically similar individuals. People crave the company of others. Think about it. Don't we all? I mean, yeah, we, we like our alone time, but we crave the company of others. But we want the company of others usually that have the same views and the same qualities that we have. Maybe even they think. Identifying too strongly, though, with any social group can lead us to that us versus them mentality. Us versus them. You know, I've talked about the word versus before, how that can be a very aggressive, a very uh, a combative word. The recognition that they aren't like myself or my group, so they are wrong or they are bad, dangerous, immoral, uh, illegal, or alien. What does that lead to, usually? Some kind of conflict. Oh, hello, Koan. Sorry, I didn't say hello. And we've seen this in history, and you've probably seen it within your own life. So since primitive man realized that there were primitive women, it seems that divisions began to arise. And it likely started with gender within the species, because that was a very, you know, easily recognized difference. But then it expanded quickly to include all those emotions and those concepts that the ego really revels in. Things like territory. Ooh, this is my place, not your place. Sex. You know, no, I hit her with the club on the head first, so she's mine. Uh, then there's skills. You know, I'm a better hunter than you are. There's money. There's material possessions. There's intelligence. There's faith and race and political choices and all kinds of other stuff. These are the divisions that we can create both within ourselves and, of course, within our interactions with others. And it only takes a modicum of mindfulness and awareness to realize the levels of unsatisfactoriness, discontent, and anguish that this kind of view has caused. Take a moment. Think about it within your own life, even within your own family. One person holds one uh, view, no matter what it may be. You hold another view, and you just can't seem to communicate after that. It's unfortunate. 
And we can listen to Americans speak eloquently about the dangers and the inequality of the caste system in India, or even the cultural divisions that arise in other countries. And then in the next sentence, they proclaim their own caste through their words and actions. Their proclamation uh, arises as one maybe based on political affiliation or sexual preference or education or race, and of course it's a long list. So again, we want to be part of a group, but we want to be an individual, but when we become part of a group, then we think other groups, now they're not as good as our group. So we're going to start, you know, we had Venn diagrams on Friday, wanted to get you kind of set up. Well, these are Venn diagrams, just kind of a little different kind, right? a little different look. Uh, so I'm going to spin my view around here so I can see. So you'll see this. This is a different type of Venn diagram here. This illustrates, oh, I'm sorry. First, we should, let's go over Friday just right quick. We talked about uh, Professor Kasulis' book, Intimacy and Integrity, and uh, we had the two Venn diagrams. We had the intimate Venn diagram and the, uh, now that went right out of my head integral relationship. Sorry about that. Uh, and so we looked at the difference between those. This particular Venn diagram here offers a different way of viewing what I call layers of association. Uh, these groups or associations that we want to belong to or that we think we belong to or that we really do belong to. Uh, so uh, I'd probably be on the wrong one here. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. So instead of layers, what we've got here is they take on a, a like a cluster of intimate Venn diagrams within a circle. One of them is indicative of influences rather than associations. And note here, all these categories overlap. And they have varying degrees of interdependence. They are not separate aspects of a person as an individual. You know, you see the words how you are, that's the big circle, how you are. And all these other things are gathered within that circle. So they combine, each as causal factors that are interconnected and interdependent that have an effect on how you are. They are not separate aspects, though, when we look at it this way. These are all just part of how we are. Right? We have health issues, we have sexual orientation, we have religion, we have race, we have politics, we have age. We have all these different groups or associations that make us how we are. So it's the choices one makes that are interdependent on those factors and others that determine how one interacts with themselves and the world around them. So in this illustration, how you are then is the entire circle leaving the possibility of intimate and integral relationships just wide open. So there is space to interconnect without the preconceptions and judgments that can come with social category. So just a little explanation here. When we talked about the, the intimate and integral uh, Venn diagrams on Friday, uh, if you remember how the, the circles came together in the intimate, and in the integral, there was just the line that, that would join the two. In this instance, what we're looking at here is these are groups or associations or ideals that one has about themselves. And they're at the cluster there of how you are. And each one kind of overlaps the other because they have their impacts on one another. But you see all that nice open space? That's potential. That's possibility. That's emptiness that can be filled with uh, new relationships, intimate relationships or integrity. So that race, social orientation, worldview, diet, politics, health issues, age, social group, education, religion, and other categories are factors in causal conditioning. They really shouldn't be used to limit our interconnection with others. What they need to be is factors in developing and strengthening encompassing interconnection. 
Like, race does not need to make one a racist. Politics certainly does not need to, uh, uh, to make one a staunch partisan. And education needn't make one judgmental, and religion needn't make one a fundamentalist. It's how one chooses to be, and that must be based in knowledge and wisdom, not in our attachment to any particular category. Now, causal conditioning does arise as a result of the associations that one accepts. Some, like race and sexual orientation, these are genetic factors, and they come with the individual. But others, like politics and religion, are choices. And whether genetic or choice, they shouldn't become dispositions or habitual reactivities that inhibit wholesome personal transformation. These associations are interconnected and interdependent parts of how you are but they're also parts of how you can choose to be. Now, in the case of genetic factors, they are permanent. We have to accept that, uh, in that you really can't alter them. They don't have to dictate how you interact with the world, though, either. Some people let race, for example, hinder their interactions with people of other races. And this becomes the disposition of racism. That a choice is... That is a choice that is causally conditioned and can be reconditioned with more appropriate view of the similarities between all human beings. Choices can also hinder interactions when they are allowed to dictate our thought and action. Whether one chooses to be, for example, a vegetarian, a carnivore, or an omnivore doesn't make them better or worse than any other person. So none of these associations should limit our connections between people. I want to talk one other thing about this one. So this is basically the individual who has a sense of how you are is the entirety of their being. Note all that empty space like I talked about before. It illustrates the potential that we have to develop new relationships. Uh, and there can be different levels of relationships. Let's go to... Okay, now this is a different view of our associations. This is where how you are is at the center, right? It's like that, that Buddha element at the center. Excuse me, here while I take a drink of water. All right, thank you. I was about to start coughing there. Okay, so again, this Venn diagram, this is a representation of the layers of association that many people surround their Buddha element with, that essence of how you are. You see it there at the center, how you are. Then you see all these layers around it, kind of like one of those uh, jawbreaker candies that as you suck on them, you get different layers, right? Now, these I, I've shown these in a specific order, not really in any order that means anything. I just picked words and put them in there. Uh, but the order, of course, is going to be different for each individual because it's dependent on what cultural division they deem most important. So like in this particular one, I, I think I chose to put on the outside race and religion. You see religion at the bottom, race at the top. And that's because these days that seems to be the two biggies that are going on in the world right now. And then closely followed there, as you'll see, So the way of defining one's self makes it extremely difficult to experience interconnection with all but those people that can actually pierce each layer. 
So the idea, white, black, brown, yellow, or red, or whatever. That's race, right? Uh, gay, straight, bisexual, transgender, asexual, pansexual, sexual orientation. Human, humanist, racist, nudist, revolutionist, pacifist. Vegan, omnivore, carnivore, breatharian, or vegetarian. Republican, Democrat, independent, green. Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Wiccan, Buddhist. High school, college, MBA, PhD, none. Geek, millennial, intellectual, hippie. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. Cancer survivor, alcoholic. ADHD, gym member, lots of categories. And those, that certainly is not all of them, right? But each of those categories define an aspect of what, who, when, why, and where a person is. But at the center is found how you are. But that center is hard for people to reach because they got to get through all those associations in order to get there. So I've talked about getting through the layers. So this diagram illustrates the near impossibility of achieving deep interconnections when presented with a body-mind that's dominated by that idea of layered associations. As an example, uh, someone whose religion and education are the same, they can penetrate those layers, right? As you can see, I, I, the, uh, the more intimate Venn diagram as it joins in. But connection ceases, in this example, at social group. Uh, one may be a millennial, the other person might be a mason. So that interconnection kind of stops at that layer. And this is how some people view themselves. So there's little chance that either is going to experience how the other person really is. Right? They get through two layers, but they never get to really how that person is. Right? The, that, let's call it, if we want the true person there at the core. How you are is too deeply protect, protected by layers of ego. Right? Ego that arises as, well, I'm this race, or I'm this religion, or this social group. So an intimate relationship, then, is really difficult to achieve. And it's really difficult to maintain. So associations must not become mechanisms of judgment. Like, I'm a Republican, you're not. Or, I'm a geek, and you're not. Or, I'm a particular Buddhist tradition, you're not. This is dualistic thinking. Who we want to avoid that when we can. Judging others based on these type of divisions is dualistic action. It must be accepted that no one's going to be just like us. Nobody. Because we are each unique expressions of the universe. And each individual is a product of different experiences, different associations, and different external factors. It must equally be accepted that everyone is a human being who encounters suffering and joy and gain and loss and fear and courage and all the other ups and downs of our human existence. We are not unique in the universe. Accepting this reality will lead to enlightened moments. These are awakened moments when interconnection and interdependence are fully realized, and then they become a deep part of how we are. It will cause the arising of knowledge that what we do matters on an encompassing scale. So, we must engage in thoughts and actions that promote wholesome, individual, and societal transformation. It is a matter of choice. So, it's a matter of choice in how we choose to view ourselves. 
we can choose to view ourselves as this type of idea, this creating little shells, you know, a layer of shells or associations, if you will, around how we are. This is an ego thing. This is to protect us. This is to say, you know, again, if you're not the same race as me or you don't eat the same kind of food as me or you don't vote like I do, then I don't want to have anything to do with you. Right? Or if I have to have something to do with you, I'm not going to treat you like I would treat somebody of, of my own uh, social group, whatever that may be. So like I showed here, that can severely limit our intimate and integral relationships because those layers have to be gotten through before you can say, for example, wow, I know this person well. Or I consider this person a close friend. It's hard to be a close friend if you've got so many layers or the other person does that you can't get through them. So it makes a lot more sense for us to think of ourselves like this. That how we are is the most important thing. How we are to others. How we are to ourselves. Because we want that potential. We want that potential of those empty circles to become people that become part of our lives. So we can be an individual and we can be part of a group or an association, if you will, as long as we understand that we are the important part. The how we are, that's the important part. So we don't have to put ourselves behind all those layers of protection. Just be who you are. Let all those associations um, strengthen each other as they strengthen you. Because just like emotions aren't us, right? They come and go and we do what, you know, sometimes we do what they want us to do. Hopefully most of the time we don't. Associations or groups can be looked at the very same way. They are outside of us. Yes, they are part of how we are, but they are outside of us. They're not a controlling factor. They're a factor that we mitigate, that we take care of.